A very warm welcome to all. A very good afternoon to all of our guests joining in from the UK. A good evening to all our guests joining in from India and South Asia. And a very good morning to all our guests joining in from the United States and South America. Today is the second seminar in the second edition of this seminar series on the topic, the digital future for business and society, emerging perspectives on AI, blockchain, and IoT. This seminar series has been hosted jointly by Professor Yogesh Dwivedi, who is a professor of digital marketing and innovation, founding director of the Emerging Markets Research Center and co-director of research, School of Management, Swansea University, Wales, UK. Our co-host for the seminar series is Professor Ramakrishnan Raman, Director, SIBM Pune, Dean, Faculty of Management, Symbiosis International University, and Director, Strategy and Development, Symbiosis. Due to some prior commitments, Dr. Raman wouldn't be able to join in right now. He would join in at a later time today during the seminar. Our entire seminar series is jointly supported by the Center for Technology, Innovation, Management, and Enterprise, shortly known as TIME, the University of Kent, UK, Digital Marketing and Analytics Special Interest Group, Academy of Marketing, Grenoble IAE Graduate School of Management, a Grenoble INP School of the University of Grenoble Alps, the e-business and e-government Special Interest Group, British Academy of Management, and the UK Academy for Information Systems. To tell you something about the seminar series itself, Emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, AI, blockchain, and Internet of Things undoubtedly offer a transformative potential for the augmentation and potential replacement of human tasks and activities within a wide range of industrial, intellectual, and social applications. The pace of change for this new AI technological age is staggering with new breakthroughs in algorithmic machine learning and autonomous decision-making, coupled with developments related to blockchain and IoT, engendering new opportunities for continued innovation. The impact of AI and other emerging technologies could be significant with industries and sectors ranging from supply chain, logistics, agriculture, finance, healthcare, manufacturing, retail, and utilities, all potentially being disrupted by the onset of these technologies. This seminar series on the digital future for business and society, emerging perspectives on AI, blockchain, and IoT will present various perspectives from a number of leading speakers, experts in the industry who would highlight these opportunities and the challenges posed by the rapid emergence of these new technologies. We have with us one such expert today, Dr. Dennis Denhi. Dr. Dennis Denhi is a lecturer in business information systems in the School of Business and Economics and a funded investigator at the Lero Research Center for Software. His research primarily focuses on the mediating role of digital technologies and analytics in the context of information systems and its implications for people, organizations, and society. His research has been published in top-ranked journals including International Journal of Operations and Production Management, European Journal of Operational Research, Information Systems Frontiers, Information and Management, IT and People, International Journal of Production Research, Government Information Quarterly, Journal of Systems and Software, and the Project Management Journal. His research is informed through extensive engagement with organizations, including Dell Technologies, Intel, Fexco, Leading Edge Group, Texuna and the Kepak Group. Now, I would request, with this brief introduction, I would request Dr. Dennis Dennehy from the School of Business and Economics, National University of uh, Galway, to go ahead and take over. Sir, thank you. Is all yours. Great. Thank you, Santosh. Thank and, you. And thank you, Yokesh, for the opportunity to present uh, what I think is a very interesting story around the use of AI in a household name known as Hitachi Vantara. Um, just to acknowledge also, I suppose, the huge contributions to the study by my co-authors and colleagues, um, Bill Schmarzo, 
So Bill has been the former Chief Innovation Officer at Hitachi Bantara. He's also the Honorary Professor here at NUI Galway and also of the Masters in Business Analytics, of which I'm the Program Director. So that's the relationship and the link with Hitachi is to, to Bill Schmarzo himself. And also with a good colleague of both of ours, um, Muwafa Sidui, who's the Dean at Menlo College, also in San Francisco. They have an ongoing relationship there with Hitachi and they're doing a study for the last number of years um, while Bill was also there. Uh, so they're great insights to do, I suppose, the dynamics of AI and innovation uh, and also for conducting the research. So I suppose I came on board then to actually develop that story and to document it and to get it published. So it's a forthcoming paper that will be published, I think in the coming weeks, as part of a special issue with the International Journal of Technology Management. Okay. So again, I suppose context is key to everything we do, particularly as researchers, the understanding, I suppose, the context of the technology, the innovation or the phenomenon in general is very important to understand. Um, I guess for the Hitachi Vantara context is that, you know, it's, it's a, a progressive company. Um, <clears throat> it's been around for many years, uh, but they have been, I suppose, very progressive in looking at the use of AI functions and developing it into their technologies for very high profile companies. Uh, other multinationals use their solutions, uh, government agencies and so on. So a lot of these, I suppose, systems uh, and solutions that to provide uh, critical real-time systems as well. So it's important that they do, I suppose, understand what the customer wants from the very outset. Um, but I guess one of the challenges there is that, you know, you have to get business people thinking like a data scientist and you've got to get data scientists thinking like the business people. So that's a big challenge in, in all companies that we, we know from the research that's going on at the moment. The, the innovation teams, which Bill was involved in, uh, they were experimenting and piloting um, design thinking tools and techniques from different methodologies that have been proposed over the years. Um, as I mentioned, Moafa had a great relationship with uh, the company based in San Francisco. They had, Bill was also a lecturer within that university, uh, a joint professor. So they did lots of workshops together. They were observing strategic meetings and also observing and interviewing domain experts in innovation and AI and understanding how they were developing design thinking artifacts to help them overcome the challenges they were having. And that key challenge is included, you know, understanding what the customer wants from the very outset and bringing that customer along a journey uh, with your innovation teams to deliver a solution um, that the customer wants, but also that solves the particular problems that they hope to achieve. Um, you know, design thinking, um, I've been a big fan of this for the last number of years since doing my PhD. Um, but in academia, I think design thinking has been misunderstood by some people, but also been dismissed over the years because people compare it to design science research. Again, there are two very different um, topics or concepts because, you know, people say, you know, design science research is about generating uh, design principles coming out of your study, whereas design thinking doesn't generate new knowledge. Well, the reality is in practice, you know, companies are using design thinking to generate new insights, uh, to create new uh, processes, to understand their innovation process in particular. So whether we like it as academics or not, we need to actually build a bridge between our own understanding of design thinking, but also how it's been used in industry. You know, um, I'll talk about the models of design thinking that have been proposed over the years and the particular one that we've used. But this is just a snapshot of how in the early days, um, Bill and his, his colleague, John, were actually trying to understand, well, we're using data science best practices and methodologies, um, but we need to ensure we actually engage with our customers a lot of these methodologies in data science, such as Chris PM, they're not customer centric, you know, and, and uh, the guys here in, in Hitachi were very quick to identify that. You know, so they wanted to move and I suppose build a bridge between, I suppose, human -set centric and machine centric innovations. You know, and that's just a, a very high level overview of, the, of their take on it. 
Okay, so I suppose I had to frame this as an academic study to plan that theoretical lens. I had to tell a good story. I thought this was the best lens looking at digital innovation. Um, we, we all are familiar with digital transformation. It's a very hot topic as well, but it's a broad topic. And within digital transformation, we have this stream called digital innovation. You know, and it's it's about value creation. You know, and co-creation. It's about you know creating shared goals for stakeholders. Their sh shared goals also include you know having a shared understanding of what is the problem first of all that you want to solve, and then creating a shared understanding of the solutions that could address this particular problem. And then coming from this, you want to have a shared commitment from all stakeholders to the solution that's been accepted to resolve the particular problem you're trying to solve. Okay, so this is, I suppose, digital innovation in a nutshell. It is the use of digital technologies, such as AI, big data analytics, and so on. And it can span, you know, uh, a number of areas of innovation, you know, business models, processes, services, and also enhancing customer experiences. And it's defined then, there's many definitions out there of digital innovation, but I really like this definition by Nambasen et al. You know, it's about the practices and the processes and principles that underlie the effective orchestration of digital innovation. And for me, this maps very well with the principles of design thinking, which is very much, you know, tools, techniques, and practices. And which we'll talk later about how we map these different concepts across to each other. I guess the, the overall motivation for the research was, we know AI is a hot topic as well, um, but really the question is, so how do we use it? Is it as a means for digital innovation or as an end? So what's, what's the goal here? You know, we've got companies uh, with great products and maybe they want to uh, redesign them by embedding AI applications within them, you know? Um, but to, to achieve this, you know, the data science teams are coming from very technical backgrounds, and that's their role to understand technical um, aspects of AI and algorithms that drive these, these models. So how do we get them to understand business problems, and how do we get managers to understand the data? And Bill Schmarzo has written numerous books on this um, around thinking like a data scientist, because it's trying to help key decision makers across the organization to ask the right questions with the data science teams. So you cannot assume that the data science teams know what you want. You have to be able to, I suppose, engage with them um, and make sure that you ask the right questions because we know if you don't ask the right questions, you won't get the answer. We also know that the CRISP-DM model is a widely used uh, practice, uh, particularly in data science. Um, it's been used very well, but in the context of, I suppose, customer service experience, Hitachi Ventara is very customer centric, you know, and Bill Schmarz built his career on focusing on the customer, you know. Um, but if you look at the crisp DM model, you know, it's all about the data, you know. Okay, there's elements there around understanding the business and understanding the data and the evaluation. But there's no discussion around the customer, you know. So that's the limitation within itself. And we also know from the literature that if companies really want to create business value, they need to be able to learn from the insights generated from their data. And as we see more and more in co with companies, um, you know, I suppose the variety of data that's coming through and the speed is very hard to make informed decisions. Even though we know that AI is supposed to do a lot of decision making for you. Well, that brings us to a whole debate around, well, at what point do key decision makers hand over the decision making process to a machine? You know, maybe that's not for today's discussion, but it does create many challenges. Particularly when you look at big multinational companies, not just Hitachi, many other multinationals, where they have embedded work practices and processes. So I suppose our goal was to, first of all, understand the context of Hitachi Ventara understand their innovation processes, get a sense of the customers, but most of all, how do you align this with their strategic vision as a company that they want to be 
I suppose, one of the, the leading companies in this area of the solutions they provide. So we came up, the aim of this study was to understand how design thinking can be used by a very data-centric and technology-centric company to advance digital innovation capabilities using AI technologies. Now, I suppose this is a very simplified version of it, almost like a Walt Disney version, because um, as you know, the complexity of working in organizations across different functions, and particularly in the multinational company, um, is very difficult, you know, to get people, I suppose, having a shared understanding of what the problem, solution, and commitment should be. Now, I'm not sure if everybody has been, is familiar with design thinking, so I'm just going to do a crash course here over the next two slides, really kind of just kind of give you a flavor of what design thinking is. So in, in summary, okay, it's very much a human-centered activity, okay? And for me, that makes sense. If you want to create customer-centric or people-centric solutions, well, this is a great stepping stone, okay? So design thinking is human-centered. It's about problem solving. There's a process to it. It's a build and evaluate, it's iterative process of learning. So you build something, you develop it, and you evaluate it, and you review, okay? Quite often, different disciplines just focus on, even organizations focus on technology. You know, the technology may not work, we can fix it. But it's about focusing on your customers, you know, and their needs. So the technology is secondary. So just because AI is the hot topic at the moment, maybe it's not the right solution that you should be proposing to your customers. So it's about understanding those needs. And you don't do that, for, you know, by just having one meeting. It's about, I suppose, living the life of your customers to understand it from their perspective, to understand the problems that they're having in order to justify why they should purchase your solution. It's about balancing this creative thinking and analytical thinking. That's easier said than done, because if you look at many data science teams and data scientists, they're coming from a very analytical mindset. So all of a sudden we expect them just to flip over to this creative, intuitive mindset. That's not easy, you know? And likewise with, with managers who are not coming from a technical background, you know, they might be creative, but their analytical thinking may not be as refined as maybe the data scientists. So it's trying to build that bridge between the different stakeholders. In this case, the data scientists and innovation teams with management and ultimately the customer. And it's about changing conditions into the most optimal um, solution that the customer wants or that you can achieve. And ultimately it's about trying to what we call solving wicked problems. So these are not linear problems where, you know, you just add some new functions maybe. Um, these are very complex um, <clears throat> solutions or problems. Um, they're very context laden. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of their customers, very tight touch from Tara, their solutions are for real time critical systems. So it's very important that we do understand that they actually understand what the customer wants on their particular problem. Now, there's numerous models have been proposed over the years about design thinking, you know, the double diamond approach, IDEO proposed approach. Um, my own favorite. Even though they all have value and they all have limitations, the one I've used myself over the last number, the last 10 years in particular, has been the approach or the model proposed by Jean Letka in Darwin Business School. I, I, I like her style. Um, she also has two great books that's very, I suppose, user friendly. So it's not just for academics, it's very practitioner focused. There's numerous templates that you can adopt and so on. But with Jean's work, uh, she's presented all over the world. She's written numerous books and published widely in this. But what I like about it is she really s simplifies, you know, under, I suppose, four stages. So, you know, what is the problem? Now, not, I won't go through all these in detail, but it's just going to say, you know, so what is the problem we're dealing with here? So the customer have has problem X, okay. Now, to understand that, there's numerous activities you need to do to really grapple with, I suppose, understanding the complexity of the problem. We live in a world where we're almost too quick to actually provide a solution, you know, uh, without really understanding what the problem is that we want to, I suppose, propose a solution to. 
And then you're looking at this idea of what if. So what if we try solving this problem with technology, we call it AI. What if we try with this technology, um, big data analytics, for example, just about exploring. And what you're seeing in this process here is that we're not running in with a single solution. We're trying to explore to see what's the most optimal solution. So we might have many solutions. We're trying to find the most optimal solution to the particular problem. And then moving to the stage of what wows. Okay, so you're creating your prototypes, you're engaging with the customer all the way through, and you're challenging assumptions. You created a particular feature or a particular model um, with assumptions that it will do A, B, C, and D. But you need to test those assumptions before you develop it from, you might call it a minimal viable product, to uh, a market product. Uh, so it's about understanding that prototyping, en engaging with customers, and refining those prototypes. And then you move towards, well, what actually works now? That was a great idea, but it doesn't actually work in practice to move towards this idea of, well, what works? Okay, so, and this is before it goes to the, the, the main launch, you know, so you're doing almost like a pre-test. So these are, I suppose, the four key stages that Jean Letka proposes. And within each of these, then she has 15 kind of activities that includes different templates that you can use as is or actually adapt them. And this is what they've been doing in Hitachi, was actually adapting these, creating their own um, visualization tools, as we call it. So you can now see why we started to map or how we started to map those phases of design thinking proposed by Jean Netka, okay? across to the stages of the crisp data model, business understanding, data understanding, data preparation, modeling, evaluation, and deploying it. And there's a brief description of each there. And all these is actually in the paper as well that will be published very soon. And then we took the different tools that have been proposed in um, design thinking, particularly from the work of Gene Letka, and started mapping them across to say, well, could this particular tool be used to address a particular problem here in the innovation process in this context with Hitachi. Um, and we'll talk, I'll actually provide one of the templates here that they created and visualization tools that Bill created with the team there. But essentially it's trying to map across design thinking with the practice of data science <coughs> based on the CRISP data model. And through this, um, they created numerous visualization tools <coughs> And this is one particular canvas that Bill and the team created. You know, now it may not make much sense to, to you when you just look, look at, it at face value, but you know, the idea behind this is that you actually print these off in you know, A0 size, you put them up a wall, you know, and you go through each element, you know, using lots of sticky notes. Each stakeholder in the room will go through what they think is relevant to each of the different sections. And through a process of distillation, you start filtering out. Uh, different sticky notes, there might be overlaps and concepts, ideas, but you're getting, I suppose, to understand what success will look like from the customer's perspective. Now, keep in mind that the customer is in the room with you as well, going through this process. And this particular process, you know, completing these visualization tools, uh, you don't do it in an hour. It can take uh, a half day, a day, a couple of days, you know, because you're always revisiting it. You're always using it as a baseline. Say, so, well, this is, we populated this back in just say January. It's now the end of January or the end of February. We now revisit and we redo it again to make sure that we're being guided by the key, the KPIs of the customer's definition of success. We also our understanding of the problem, the solution, the solution, and so forth. Okay, so it's not just a tick box exercise, it's, it's an ongoing process. Now I suppose I'm going to present some of the, the, the reported benefits. So this research went on for two years, right up until last summer until we submitted the paper, the final version. We had engaged, well, Mo, Moafa had done most of the groundwork because he's based in San Francisco. Um, but over the two years, you know, he done numerous interviews. Um, he did interviews, participant observations, uh, attended workshops, observed people like Bill developing the artifacts, the visualization tools. Um, and over that time, I suppose, there were challenges, which I'll talk about also, but it's trying to get people to understand, well, 
if we adopt these new techniques, there should be benefits. Now, this is what the literature is telling us, but we had to find out, well, what are the reported benefits for Hitachi Vantara? And for me, I use this idea of, you know, being of hearts and minds, because it's that idea of the intuitive thinking and the analytical thinking. So again, bringing the practitioners across the entire organization and the customers um, to a point where they actually can see very early what the potential benefits of design thinking are in the context of their digital innovation strategy. Um, th the reason we, put, we picked the cognitive, social, and emotional is because it comes from the literature. Um, and it is actually important because in practice, in many meetings, people rely on those who talk the loudest. And that's the message that people take away from the meeting. But if you can tap into the idea of, you know, the cognitive, the social, and the emotional, is what uh, D'Amico talks about in the literature, you know, that it helps you avoid that dominant viewpoint uh, during a particular face-to-face -face meeting. But it's also this idea that comes from the literature by Epler and Platz, who talks about the visual representation of information. You know, so when you create these visualization tools and canvases and sticky notes, you know, you're engaging. How you engage with people is very different because it's, not, it's no longer two personalities talking to each other. There is a, an intermediary, and that is your visualization tool and the use of sticky notes. So everybody gets a voice in the innovation process. So it's important that, you know, all ideas are valid, you know, they may not be practical, but through that process of distillation of following a proposed um, design thinking methodology, you can eventually determine what's the most optimal solution to propose here. Um, so at the cognitive level, you know, uh, the feedback from participants, uh, or employees of the company and their customers was this idea has improved their problem solving abilities. <clears throat> The visualization approach uh, helps them to recall very quickly um, discussions, particularly strategic dis discussions uh, from previous events, because you're now creating this visual environment where people can actually see and recall, okay, oh, this is the, the canvas we created back in January. We're going to populate it now again today, five weeks, six weeks later. Um, so it helps them to recall uh, very quickly, but also more accurately. Um, it creates what I call this idea of a, a shared understanding, but also a shared understanding of possible solutions and a commitment. There's no point in there, but no point in having a solution if there's not shared commitment about all stakeholders to deliver that solution. Um, and very quickly, you, you, you will see areas of agreement or particularly disagreement. Um, and it keeps the focus. You know, the focus of this meeting is about, you know, solving a particular problem, to innovative solutions. We're going to use AI in this context. So it keeps a very focused, strategic, innovative kind of boundary in your, your discussions and it moves away from that personality kind of conflict kind of piece. Um, and we already know from the literature as well that, you know, visualization tools and stories slash storytelling, it changes the whole dynamic because you're now asking, you know, about uh, events narratives, you know, um, which is very different than just using hardcore KPIs or surveys based on customer feedback and so on. And you create this kind of positive, yes, we can do attitude, you know, because you always have limitations in the innovation. It could be resource limitations, funding, um, time constraints and so on. So it's about overcoming those challenges are using this positive mindset. Now, these are some challenges that we came across that were reported in the case, but also we've seen in the literature prior to this as well. You know, so, um, you know, innovation is a, is a very um, social process, you know, but again, organizations need processes in place to manage that process. However, sometimes they can actually stifle creativity and innovation within teams particularly the culture of the organization. Quite often there are very deep seated um, institutionalized routines and practices. Um, and when you ask people, well, why do we do it this way? The response is, well, we've always done it like this. So it's trying to move beyond and say, well, if you're adopting this new innovation or this new AI, 
um, solution, for example, well, what impact will it have on your processes? Will it make some obsolete? Will, it, will there be a need to create new processes and policies and practices around this new technology? Um, again, you know, there's a, a fear. Uh, people are always more comfortable in their comfort zone. So, you know, if you're coming from a very analytical background, that is your view of the world. So moving between the analytical and the intuitive uh, can be challenging. And lots of studies have looked at this, you know, how do, people, how do business people make decisions? Is it with their head or with their gut? Um, they all say with their head, but offline they usually say, well, I just had an in instinct that this is the right way to go with a particular strategy or something like this. Um, Gene Ledcat talks very much around this idea of a growth mindset, you know, um, you know, not be afraid to take risks, you know, embracing uncertainty, you know, and this is, allows companies to thrive, you know. If you keep a very stagnated mind and punish people for making failures because they try to innovate, well, you're not going to grow as a company. So instilling this growth mindset in employees, not just in the innovation team, but across the organization is very, very important. <clears throat> the culture, organization culture, plays a huge role in, I suppose, adopting technologies or even design thinking tools and techniques. Um, you know, if you've got that openness, it's much easier to adopt uh, new ways or, or emerging practices coming out of uh, the research, maybe, or in other companies across different industries. <clears throat> so, um, organizational silos it still exists. Uh, it can be at the team level, you know, it could be at the functional level, um, it could be at the individual level, you know, so it's trying to create that, I suppose, openness, um, removing the barriers to help people understand how different people in the organization view problems and approach these problems with particular solutions. And just, I suppose, some of the final thoughts in this particular study. There have been numerous calls over the last number of years um, asking for more research, particularly rigorous research on dig digital innovation. You know, lots of people are talking about uh, digital transformation, but as you know, digital innovation is only a subset of the black bigger topic, you know. I suppose the study itself tries from the complementary nature of data science tools and techniques and methodologies with design thinking tools and practices and techniques, you know, because they're, you can adapt them, you know, but learning how to adapt them is key. It's not about adopting them, you know, oh, we, we've adopted it uh, in the last 24 hours. You know, that's very binary. What you want to achieve here is to embed it but that takes time, it takes trial and error. It's about um, you know, building that cumulative building of knowledge within the organization to embed it in the DNA of innovation mindset of the company. Um, we know from the literature, you know, they do say that the design thinking, we know it doesn't do that data science, but it does make it better and vice versa. You know, and Bill Schmarzer has been a huge adv advocate of this himself with his own publications and his own books and so forth. You know, it's about creating this team empowerment to ideate collectively, you know, and through that process of distillation, you know, you come up with optimal solutions. And they believe that's one of the, I suppose, contributing factors that makes Hitachi Vantara uh, a leading company in this, this field. Uh, Cross-disciplinary collaboration. We know how challenging it is ourselves in academia when we collaborate with people from different disciplines. It's the exact same with industry, you know, and it's even more difficult when you try to collaborate with industry and academia. So again, it's trying to find, I suppose, the, the right personalities, the proponents of your particular research. That's very important to engage with industry. Uh, but also within the organization, finding ambassadors. Um, you know, if anyone wants to um, find an ambassador as a role model, Bill Schmarzo would be one for me, you know, He's a huge fan of design thinking. Uh, he didn't do it for the last 30, 40 years, but it's in the last number of years that he became aware of it and started adapting it to his own practices. And Bill has worked with many, many multinational companies. And he's great at, at driving home at this idea of it's an organizational mindset. You know, it's not just one person that can carry this over the line. It needs to be a team effort, you know. Um, design thinking has been used um, across all disciplines and industries in the last number of years, 
is being used or received in public sector, private sector, and in recent years in international development, where people are saying, well, the traditional donor model um, has not worked for developing countries. We need to understand the end, the intended beneficiaries, the context of their lives, and they're using tools from design thinking to kind of understand that, com that context of their, their customers in the context of international development, uh, people living in extreme poverty and so forth. So we do know design thinking has a huge amount to offer. Um, it just hasn't got that recognition as much, I don't think, in, in some disciplines of academia, um, because it, the view is that, well, these are just tools, they just, you just use them, you know, but from this study, you can see that you can still do great research, you know, by engaging with industry and telling a great story. Um, and that's it really in a nutshell. Um, I think one of the contributions of the study is that, you know, we've, by extending the generalizability of design thinking, we've provided novel insights about the challenges and benefits and the lessons learned when innovation slash data science teams uh, adapt design thinking to bridge and balance their analytical and intuitive thinking. Um, but that doesn't happen overnight. It, it takes time, you know, uh, no pain, no gain. You know, that's one of Bill's um, mantras. <clears throat> but if you, if you can actually stay with it and keep that momentum, um, it actually does provide those benefits, which we've seen with Hitachi Ventara. And um, that just brings me to the end of my talk. And conscious of time, we have 38 minutes gone. I just want to stop share so you can actually see me as well. And with that, I'll hand you back to Santosh. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dennis. Uh, this has been, uh, you know, a very uh, inspiring area that you, uh, you know, brought us to, which is organizing, uh, uh, you know, what do you say, data science and innovation uh, using design thinking principles. And this is probably a new area. Uh, before we move on to questions, participants, a uh, quick request, uh, you know, please post in your questions in the chat box. But we have with us uh, Dr. Yogesh Devedi, sir. Uh, sir, first of all, thank you very much uh, for this wonderful opportunity for bringing together such wonderful experts all around the world for uh, this seminar series. Uh, sir, I would like to request you and your some inputs from your end on this area as well. Thank you, Denise, for, for your very interesting and wonderful talk. Obviously, I'm, um, I cannot provide input in this area because this is not my expertise, but uh, I, I would like to ask something uh, to Denise. You know, it, it's very interesting. Obviously, these kind of approaches bring lots of richness, as you mentioned. Um, however, it's also very, very difficult for not everyone can pursue this approach because finding the contact with companies and this label of access when they can go in and do these kind of iteration or discussion or, you know, it's not, not easy unless you have lots of uh, trust yeah. between the researcher and company, it's not going to happen. So how, how one can, if new researcher aspiring to do this, Dennis, how, what would you recommend that person? How to go about it? Sure. Um, that's a very good question, Yokesh, because I've worked on many industry folks projects. You know, in this particular case, um, I wasn't on site with um, Hitachi Ventara, but Bill did come to Ireland quite a lot over the last couple of years. However, I worked with other companies that Santos alluded to, um, where I was on site once, once twice a week for months, because it's about building that relationship um, and building that trust, as you mentioned, uh, Yokesh, is so important because many practitioners may have had bad experiences of academic engagement in the past. So what makes you different from them? Well, you need to have clear outputs that are a win-win for both sides. My experience I've seen in the past with different uh, academics is grab and go. You know, we need data, give us the data and they're gone. There's no outputs coming back to the company. So when I work with companies, we provide from the very outset a commitment 
to providing reports, uh, doing presentations in in house uh, around findings. We bring them on as co-authors in papers. So you're showing them how they can develop their staff uh, who would be keen. Many companies want their staff to co-author papers because it allows them to position themselves as thought leaders in the industry by showing that they've collaborated with the university, they've published their, their work and their, their own thinking around a particular phenomenon. But to build that relationship, you have to be on site. You know, you're going in there talking to people, understanding that human story uh, I come from a qualitative background, so I'm very comfortable with that messiness of human behavior. You know, I enjoy working, sitting down, watching people work, talking to them, learning from them. But it's not for everybody, Yokesh. Not everybody likes to work with companies. So it's about understanding, well, are you the great philosopher, which is great. We need philosophers in our disciplines too. But maybe you're not the right philosopher to send out to industry. So maybe you like, you know, so it's about finding your place and then knowing who are the right people to engage with companies. But having clear KPIs from the beginning to show them that every quarter, for example, you provide um, updates, you provide reports, uh, you might facilitate workshops, you might have keynote speakers coming into them. You know, um, Bill, when Bill was over here um, each year, we did industry workshops for free. You know, we brought companies in and said, this is our way of saying thank you to you for allowing us access to your company. So Bill did workshops on the university campus. He went into the companies, did one hour to a half day workshops, even full hour work, full day workshops, you know. Um, and we didn't charge them for that. You know, companies really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Danish. I, I have two minor questions before, uh, before um, you know. So the the one thing you said very interesting uh, that uh, you know generally you uh, you know consider including the uh, person from company as a co-author. So would that is have you ever faced problem with journals or editors saying that well you know would this be appropriate if, if the if the person is from same company where data is coming would this be appropriate? So have you ever faced this problem? So that's just uh, one question. Other one, I, uh, yeah, other one is that, uh, of course you mentioned that, uh, you know, you generally, it's, it's good to have some kind of output uh, uh, to show them that, look, we, we're going to help you in some way. Yeah. So, and, and obviously design science kind of design thinking uh, type of uh, project generally, what I can see through your uh, presentation, you're leading towards some kind of solving some problem by producing a certain uh, solutions, prototypes. Now, have you ever faced problem where you produce something and they thought, oh no, this is not something we think is appropriate. Although academically it might have been perfectly what you wanted uh, or what you thought is really interesting for yeah. academic audience, but it may not have been really something what they actually right. desired. Yeah? yeah. So these, these are two questions that I wanted to ask you. Thank you. So the answer to both is yes. Um, so for example, if a practitioner is on a, a paper as co-author, um, you won't be able to use their data in your findings because that shows bias. So what we did in one case, we actually had the CEO in one paper that we published a few years back where we had their data originally in the, the findings. And then during the review process, we brought the CEO on as a co-author um, to strengthen, I suppose, the, the paper and the feedback was, well, you have to remove his data. So the editor gave us a choice, bring him on or remove his data. So we brought him on just to demonstrate that this was a real company, that we were not making up this company. It's a real company with challenges around um, innovation as well. Um, also, yeah, creating outputs for companies. Um, I remember one time we created some visualization tools for a company. We thought it would help with, uh, I suppose, understanding the complexity of the work and it didn't, it didn't really work. But you know what? They were fine. 
they're not like it's, it comes back to that trust again your cash it's trial and error you know we try something it works great sometimes it doesn't or we need to adapt it you know but i think when companies know knows that you're being genuine and sincere and that you want to provide a solution to them and it doesn't have to be hardcore algorithm or visualization tools or anything like this it could be just helping them to implement a process you know it could be adopting a new technology so how do you help them to do that um Obviously, there will be challenges along the way, but I think people are very forgiving. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I wanted to ask. So, Santos, mm -hmm. you can proceed to ask questions. Thank audience. you. Thank you. Surely. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yogi, sir, and uh, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Dennis, as well, uh, because, uh, you know, setting uh, these basic concepts right uh, is, and, and you made the concept very clear for early researchers who would want to explore this as an opportunity. I have a question which actually sprung up as uh, part of your answer to Yogeshwar's question. Uh, but I would ask that after I uh, take this question from the chat box. Uh, we have Ms. Galina Kondrateva who has asked a question and uh, she mentions, Hi from Paris. Thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, the topic of design thinking as a human-centered activity made me think about the research that we have done on the creation of art pieces with AI. You have listed some challenges, but I'm wondering if there are issues in business that we discovered in arts. Copyrights, who created what, in co-creation, co-innovation, competition of collaborators and technology. Sure, so thanks Santosh for, for reading that out. Um, hi Galina. Um, I'm familiar with your work. I read your work uh, last year, as you know. Um, but yeah, there are power struggles in industry, uh, particularly when it comes to shared business models, for example, with different stakeholders, being different companies. But I think in pri the private sector has a huge amount that they could learn from arts. But we haven't done that very well. Um, but, you know, with different industries, we need to learn from each other. And I think that's one area that um, trying to get published, you know, bridging arts with traditional business um, has been misunderstood as well. But there's absolutely, I think, great opportunities for us to learn from other disciplines, in particular arts. Um, competition of collaborators, absolutely. We've seen that over the years, for example, with uh, mobile payments. You know, that is, and I suppose, a solution that's delivered to the end customer but involves multiple stakeholders being different companies from is a bank led business model, is a telecom led business model, uh, or is a is a startup that's neither bank or telecom led. You know, so depending on your business model, you're gonna have different stakeholders. So th there are absolutely legal, I suppose, complexities behind all of this as well. A lot of legal issues. Um, and usually when you're engaging with industry, uh, for research projects, you do have to still go through the technology transfer office to make sure that um, the, the rights of new knowledge, artifacts, and so on, is owned either by the company or by the university or board. But from the very outset, it needs to be very clear who owns what. Thank you. Thank you for that answer, Dr. Dennis. Uh, we've got another question from uh, Hajar Kefi. Uh, and he uh, and uh, the question is, hi, great talk. Thank you. Uh, in your experience, are data scientists willing to embrace design thinking? Is this natural from them? So I, I, I'm smiling here because <clears throat> it reminds me of when I first started college as an undergrad student. Um, I had a mindset of a computer scientist. And in my first few weeks, and to a mutual friend, I met a computer scientist who was just saying his fourth year of computer science. I think he's doing a master's at the time, actually. And I was amazed at how human he was, you know? Uh, he's just so outgoing and friendly and very um, conversational. I was like, oh, wow. You know, my image of a uh, computer scientist was somebody who's very just withdrawn, very geeky. Um, but you know what? We're all human at the end of the day. And we have to learn to learn. And that's not easy, you know? Um, I don't think we should define ourselves by our the hat we wear at work. We have many different hats, and behind all these hats, at the end of the day, we're, we're human. It's trying to 
develop a growth mindset. You know, if you look at the literature out there and the growth mindset, you know, it's not about being positive all the time. You know, we can relapse into being negative about particular contexts or trying to find solutions to problems uh, at work and personal lives and so on. But it's trying to flip it over to say, well, okay, this is the challenge or this is the problem I'm faced with. Now, two choices find a positive outcome or a negative outcome. What route you go down is your, your choice. So moving to that growth mindset and surrounding yourself with the right people will allow you to flourish. And if you just get one person in your team to become that ambassador who can contaminate the rest of the team in a very positive way with this idea, guys, this works, this can, we can do this, it will flourish or it may take time. So I, I wouldn't generalize data scientists as being not able to do or adapt design thinking tools. In this case, we've shown it, but we need to show sometimes maybe guidance and to understand their thinking around it. I did visualization tools for my PhD as one of my outputs for my PhD. I was at workshops, I was facilitating, and I could see just some people just standing looking at this going, this is rubbish, you know? They didn't say that, but I could see it from their the body language. You know, I had two choices, to ignore them or actually talk to them. I used to talk to them and understand where they're coming from, you know, so it's really about engaging, you know, and developing relationships with people. And ultimately what Yokesh mentioned there was trust, you know, people trust you, they trust your motivations and vice versa. Thank you for uh, that answer, uh, Dr. Dennis. I have uh, my question coming up. So, uh, my, my, uh, so if you see uh, the situation in India, there are a lot of corporate companies who would wish to speak to academia. So uh, the first barricade has been crossed in the sense that uh, people earlier used to think that industry is separate and academia is separate and they both talk different languages, they lead different lives. So I think that barricade has been crossed and uh, industry and academia, you know, partnerships have started. What would be a good point to, you know, take this, uh, you know, one step further towards the research that you've done? Uh, in the sense, corporate talks or uh, discussions by industry leaders in academia, that is something that has already been explored. What would be a second natural step as uh, progression, in your opinion? Okay. To give you an example, a few years back, um, we were working with a multinational company based in Ireland, and they're adopting a new software methodology. But the mindset was, oh, we're too big. We're a multinational, that would never work here. So what we did is we organized a series of workshops where we invited other people from other multinationals in Ireland and other similar sized companies into workshops who were actually more advanced in the use of this software development methodology called Flow. Uh, so I had to break down that silo thinking at the organizational level, or oh, we're too big or we're too small, you know, um, so it's about helping companies to share their learnings as well. And during these workshops, we had companies saying, yeah, actually, yeah, we've actually used just a Tableau in our software development process. And this is how we were able to link it to our a code management tool. You know, so it wasn't, no, it wasn't just us trying to drive home a particular message. There's a shared message saying, these are the problems, you will have problems, but there are solutions out there uh, either from within your industry or outside of your industry. So in the room, we have multinationals, um, national banks, for example, startup companies, all inside the room, usually small workshops, 30 to 40 people. Uh, we never charge them for it because we're using it on campus. And the companies really value that. And if you can link it to CPDs, continuous professional development, it makes it very attractive. Um, I, I've done seminars, public seminars in the past, where actually Bill Schmarzo was one of the speakers and it was accredited by the Project Management Institute of Ireland. You know, and their members came for this evening workshop, a seminar for a two hour seminar followed by Q and A and so on. So there's many ways to kind of to capitalize on what you're doing and to create, I suppose, research units as well, you know, to, to allow for that flow of knowledge and to become the experts. So for example, somebody says, yeah, so, I'm having a problem with my use of AI, for example, in a particular context or design thinking. What university is best known for it? So you might have different clusters within just say in India, 
but then if you have a, a national platform as well for other companies external from India to actually engage in that process as well. True, true, very true. Uh, very interesting insights that you brought out uh, because I think continuous professional development is an area that uh, companies do strive for and uh, these are ways that I think academia can definitely contribute. Thank you for putting uh, interesting thoughts in my head and I'm definitely going to leverage or at least explore. Uh, Thanks, we have... Also, Sankosh, sometimes companies don't know how to engage with academia. Yes. So, you know, we, we have to show them what that collaboration could look like. You know, you can say, look, well, I work with this company down the road. Why don't you talk to them? Um, one of the companies we we're working on, a multinational, uh, a number of the staff had left during that two-year project that we we're working on. They moved to another multinational, also based in Ireland. Those staff started telling their managers about the work we were doing. And from that came another project, a two and a half year project. You know, so, so it was actually a four, four year project that I came from, original two year project up to four year project. But that's your word of mouth. Absolutely true. So many times, as you say rightly, they're not aware of uh, such possibilities. So maybe sowing that seed uh, itself is the first step, probably. True. I will definitely explore these. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay. We have a question from Tegwin Malik. And uh, the question is, thank you so much for your talk. Really interesting. Do you think there are different challenges for this type of human-centered thinking that considers AI capabilities in that what-if stage you were talking about when it comes to SMEs or startups? Uh, I think some are transferable challenges across all organizations, um, regardless of size or context, and others might be specific uh, or unique to that particular uh, company. So a few years ago, we actually published a paper in the Journal of Decision Systems uh, two years ago. Uh, the case study was with Texuna Technologies, you know, and we talked about the challenges they had in the innovation process but also we use the lens of design thinking, you know, so in that context, you see different challenges uh, unique to that particular company, which is an SME that offices in Cork here in Ireland, uh, in London and in Russia. Um, but also if you look at the literature around um, Carl Gren, I forget the, name, the, the year, but he actually looked at the challenges of design thinking in large companies. So there are studies that focus on different aspects of it. Thank you. Um, there is a request now. Uh, so there's a request from Ms. Kajol and uh, she says, thank you for the insightful session. Uh, please suggest some research papers or books for the understanding of design thinking model. So definitely uh, Jean Ledka. She's, um, they do online courses as well. So the University of Virginia, the Darwin School uh, they do uh, online courses in design thinking. Um, I did myself a few years back after my PhD. And at the time, I think it was maybe a 16 week course, but they since learned that the intensity and length was too long. So they've now provided smaller courses online, but absolutely brilliant courses that they do. In, in terms of uh, the literature, you know, the, there's a book by, um, Moti, Idris Moti on design thinking for strategic innovation. It's a great book. Um, I actually, if I can share my screen, I can show you the slide here. If that is okay. Please, please do so. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so these are some books that I've used myself in the past. The Growth Field Book is the actual the book that Jean. Uh, is her second book that she wrote to complement her design thinking for growth book. So there's the book all around the fundamentals of design thinking, and these are the templates in this particular book. Uh, I particularly like this book, uh, How You Can Fulfill Your Potential, that mindset. It's just a different take, I suppose. It's good for everybody to read if you're looking at this idea of having a growth mindset. And that book I mentioned around um, by Idris Morty. And also some papers, that um, you, I could put these in the the room is in the the chat room. So I'll just copy these, paste, and I'll paste these into the chat here for everybody. 
Uh, if not, I'll have to send them to you. Uh, hopefully this will work. So, so it's not allowing me to copy and paste, but I will, I can share them with you, Santosh, no problem. Surely. I will uh, go ahead and ensure that it reaches. Uh, okay. the I feel free if anybody wants to contact me. Uh, I'll just put in my, my email here as well if they want. Um, maybe just CC uh, your cash or Santosh if you're contacting me as well. Um, but there's my email. I'm happy to send down some literature there as well. One thing, uh, Dennis, that um, bothers obviously editors, as, as you probably experienced uh, by yourself, um, that design science and design research um, and obviously design thinking. Um, one challenge is where there's a lack of clarity in terms of theoretical contribution. So what is actually theoretical contribution? Because obviously generally you, neither you are developing theory nor you are testing theory. And, and that poses real challenge. Editors, okay, but reviewers, not okay. And if reviewers not okay, then editors can't do much about it. So I think that there is a real need how, how design research or design science uh, research can be developed. This approach can be developed further where actually theory development or theory testing can be integrated in some form so that, it, so that you have something academic as well as obviously it's very rich for, for practice, but also a strong contribution to academia. So that's, that's just my, it's not a question, of course, it's just uh, my own observations that I wanted to share with you. I, uh, yeah, I agree, Gokesh. The, theorizing, uh, I think is a challenge, not just because of design thinking, but for many phenomena that academics are studying. Um, and then people get a rejection, they don't understand, but I wrote, I wrote 20 pages, but you didn't, theorize about the phenomenon or the theory you're using. And also, I think people misunderstand the difference between a contribution and implication. So, you know, implications for practice or research is very different than contributions. And you'll often see that people bundle it together, hoping that a good reviewer will pick up that they don't really know what they're doing. But you need to be able to separate it out. And if you can itemize what your contributions are, and your implications for practice and implications for theory, well then that puts you on a much stronger footing to demonstrate the theorization around your particular study. Very truly said, uh, Dr. Dennis. Uh, thank you, thank you for those wonderful inputs. I see that you've also pasted uh, the references in the chat along with your email id as well and uh, thank you for sharing your contacts and uh, i'm sure uh, all the questions have been addressed and uh, as we come to a close for today's seminar uh, i would also like to take this opportunity to uh, you know congratulate uh, dr yogesh Pivedi once again uh, on the wonderful research that he continues to perform and uh, inspire all of us uh, the last seminar, just for your information, Dr. Dennis, and for others as well, the last seminar that happened on 11th of August, which was the first seminar series uh, in this edition, uh, he had about 25,000 Google Scholar citations, and today in about a month, uh, that's crossed 30,000 uh, you know, citations. Uh, Dr. Yogesh Duvedi, this is just pure magic that you do. I hope that uh, you know all of us, at least some of us, do uh, you know are able to reach uh, to what you have achieved so easily at this, uh, you know, level, and uh, with your guidance, I'm, I'm sure, uh, and with all the inputs that, uh, with the experts that you brought on uh, during the seminar series, I'm sure uh, that would definitely become a possibility. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Dr. Dennis, for taking out your uh, time for sharing your inputs with all of us. Uh, thanks to your co-authors as well, uh, Hitachi Ventura, and uh, thank you, Yogesh sir, and. Uh, so there is a comment, uh, sorry, before we close. Um, 
Hajar Kafi uh, says, I totally agree with uh, Yogesh. One of my doctoral students uh, tried to publish a paper using a design science approach. The paper got rejected and I had to suggest him to build hypotheses from the literature and test them in a model. So your question, uh, your suggestion, in fact, has been uh, something that is actually you know, uh, found those kind of challenges as well. So thank you all. Thank you once again, uh, Dr. Yogesh. Thank you, Dr. Dennis. Uh, thank you all participants. And looking forward to meet you all uh, in the upcoming seminar, seminar series two, the, sec the third edition coming up on 20th of October. Thank you. Thank you.